All right, I see the Zoom room is filling up. It is Tuesday at noon. It's time for the virtual speaker series presented by the Penn State Alumni Association. Looking forward to today's conversation with Sham Sundir. He's gonna be talking about fake news and why we fall for it. Again, let us know who you are and where you're from in the chat box. Go ahead and let us know where you're zooming in from today. Are you on the West Coast in sunny California or are you here in cold and snowy Happy Valley, Pennsylvania? Let us know where you're zooming in from. Madison, Wisconsin in a blizzard. I see you up there, Dave. David and Vicki in Harrisburg and Emily Grills in New Jersey. I see Pam Hall in Lancaster. Oh, a good crowd in, uh, in Madison, Wisconsin. I see Sue also zooming in from Madison. Rachel's right here in State College. Welcome to the virtual speaker series. We will be getting started in just a minute with our presentation from Sham Sundir. He's a PhD from Stanford University, but he is the James P. Jamiro Professor of Media Effects and the founding director of the Media Effects Research Laboratory right here at Penn State. Looking forward to his presentation and our conversation. If you have a question for Professor Sundar, you can put that in the chat box or in the Q&A, all questions in the Q&A. We will get to as many of those as we possibly can. I also see a number that have been pre-submitted. We will be getting those, getting to those as well. Good to see you as always, Paul McConaughey up in Cape Cod. Thanks for joining in. I see Ken Cutler joining us from IC State College. Good to see my friend and colleague Ken joining us on this. I guess former colleague, now that you're retired, hope all is well with you. And Kathy Bittner up in Cambridge, Vermont. Where else would you rather be than a Zoom full of Penn Staters? Thank you for joining us. I'm Paul Clifford, CEO of the Penn State Alumni Association. And I wanna welcome everybody to today's virtual speaker session, which is being recorded. Live closed captions are available for this event. You can access them by clicking the closed caption button at the bottom of the Zoom video window, and then clicking show subtitle. You can also customize your caption view by clicking the stream to text link posted in the chat. We are live streaming today's presentation, and this live stream has been made possible through the gracious support of a donor and the Fund for Access, Ideas, and Audacious Goals. Today's presentation will be archived and available on our website after the event. This afternoon, we welcome Sham Sundir, a PhD from Stanford University, but he is the James P. Jamiro Professor of Media Effects and the founding director of the Media Effects Research Laboratory right here at Penn State. Fake news can be deadly. During the pandemic, false information about causes, spread, and cure related to COVID-19 have shaped actions at both the individual and institutional levels. In places like India, scores of innocent people have been lynched by vigilant mobs after false rumors of child kidnapping and organ harvesting spread in the form of doctored videos shared via WhatsApp, uh, via the WhatsApp encrypted messaging system. Dr. Sham Sandir, with funding from WhatsApp and the National Science Foundation, has been investigating the psychology of our susceptibility to online misinformation and working on solutions to address this scourge of modern media. Professor Sandir's research investigates social and psychological effects of technological elements unique to online communication. His experiments investigate the role played by technological affordances in shaping user experience of mediated communications 
and a variety of interfaces from websites and social media to mobile media and robotics. Professor Sundar edited the first ever handbook on the psychology of communication technology and served as editor in chief of the Journal of Computer Mediated Communication from 2013 to 2017. It's my pleasure to welcome Professor Sundar to the virtual speaker series today, and I'm gonna turn it over to you. Good to see you, Sham. Thank you, Paul. Thanks for uh, that introduction. Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to this uh, speaker session on fake news. Let me start by sharing my screen. So the topic for today, as Paul mentioned, is uh, fake news and uh, the psychological aspects of it, why we fall for fake news and what we could do about it. And we've been studying this in our BDFX lab for the last uh, 20 plus years. So fake news is not new. Uh, as you might know, some of the old timers know that we've had conspiracy theories like the TWA crash being orchestrated by um, uh, the military uh, by US Navy, this back in 1990s. And that was um, a controversy that was spread by a credible source, uh, the press secretary of President Kennedy, no less. But these kinds of um, fake news were quickly spotted by TV and newspaper gatekeepers. And um, when they did happen, they were retracted if the facts did not check out. And this was something that we've seen even before uh, television and mass media. Misinformation has existed you know, well before media itself and uh, before, well before the internet. So what's the difference now? The difference is uh, many things, but I'd focus my remarks today on two things, two things that we've done some research on in our lab. One is source of fake news and another is modality of fake news. Around the turn of this century, with the arrival of interactive media, there has been a fundamental shift in communication such that traditional models of communication where the source was an expert or a professional journalist and the receiver was simply a passive consumer of information, the, the whole equation changed quite a bit with, with the arrival of interactive media because interactive media made it possible for receivers to become sources of communication. So the receivers became sources. They have become sources now. They've become creators of content. Uh, they create their own content and they disseminate what they create um, on a very wide scale, unprecedented scale. So this kind of uh, dissemination kind of came to a head around the presidential election time in uh, 2016 when uh, these uh, receivers started creating new stories like this, uh, patently false information that was uh, circulated via social media, leading to what some people call a fake news invasion. But most scholars like me did not really take this that seriously until we saw this chart from BuzzFeed, which showed for the first time, fake news exceeded mainstream news in terms of its uh, engagement, uh, especially on social media. And this happened very close uh, toward the 2016 election. And as you can imagine, false information can uh, be quite uh, important, uh, quite consequential in the context of elections and politics where conspiracy theories um, are plenty and there's uh, a strong confirmation bias, a strong need for people to confirm their inherent predispositions. And that in fact uh, drives their selectivity in what they watch, what they view, what they wanna believe. And we all kind of form our own little filter bubbles but fake news also matters beyond politics. It matters in the case of literacy. You know, we try to teach our students how to spot correct information. So literacy in terms of, uh, you know, getting the right information for research, for education, and increasingly for our own health. As you well know, COVID-19 has brought its own, uh, uh, you know, battery of fake news, uh, fake news about the causes, about cures, uh, about um, the vaccine. Uh, there are all kinds of uh, fake news about the vaccine, how it might cause infertility, how it might have a microchip embedded by Bill Gates, no less, uh, and so forth. So 
The question is, do we just simply laugh it off? Uh, do consumers of news really distinguish between fake and real news? Um, and do they really distinguish between kind of professional sources and layperson sources? This was the curiosity that I had uh, for my doctoral dissertation uh, back in the 1990s, um, when I did an experiment with the undergraduate at Stanford University, where I exposed participants to exact same news stories. But the only thing that I did was I told them different things about who or what the source was. So one fourth of my participants were told that these stories were selected by news editors in a newsroom. The, another one fourth were told that uh, this, uh, this was uh, selected by a special algorithm by the computer. Uh, a third group was told that other users collectively chose these stories. And a fourth group was led to believe that they themselves chose these stories. And when we looked at the data, we found overwhelmingly people liked the stories much more when they thought that other users chose the story compared to when they thought the news editors uh, chose the story. And we found the same pattern with what they thought uh, about the newsworthiness of the story and also about the quality of the story. The quality was considered much better even when others chose the story compared to when news editors or they themselves chose the story, even though the story content was identical in all these conditions. So what this tells me is that uh, other users or peer sources are quite influential in influ influencing our perceptions of news stories. And this is an especially a problem with social media where we have uh, rampant, what we call social layering. Uh, social layering, source layering, is the idea that um, you know there are multiple sources that are layered one on one on top of another. You can see here there's a story in the LA Times that was then um, tweeted by uh, Vice President Kamala Harris, which then was retweeted uh, by another person. Now, who or what is the source here? Is it um, the friend that uh, sent it to you or tweeted about it? Is it the politician um, who chose the story for tweeting? Or is it LA Times, the newspaper? Or is it Twitter, the, the social media platform? Uh, who or what is the source? Our studies repeatedly, a lot of experiments in my lab have shown that people think it is the proximate source, the source that handed off the story to you, which in this case is the friend. So source layering, what it does is puts the focus on the proximate source, the most uh, you know, immediate source from whom you get the information. And increasingly, a lot of us get that information from aggregator sites uh, like uh, Comcast or Verizon uh, or social media sites. So aggregators and social media friends become our proximate sources whom, whom we believe in, but they are not professional journalists. We don't stop to think that they're not trained in journalism. They don't uh, fact check and vet the facts. Um, and so this is, this is a, one of the problems of uh, sourcing. A kind of a related issue is self as source. A lot of us get our information on our very personalized, customized uh, environments like our cell phones and our portals. And so when, when we get information in these very personal spaces, we tend to believe it more. So we've done studies where we've seen that uh, when people customize their environment, after they customize something, we ask them to add a blog or add an RSS feed in which we kind of uh, put in some fake health stories like, uh, you know, raw milk is better than pasteurized milk or sunscreen is actually harmful to your health because it deprives you of vitamin D. And we find, lo and behold, people who customize their uh, environment are so wrapped up in their identity that they fail to systematically process this kind of fake health messages. And they're in fact persuaded by these kinds of uh, fake health messages and proceed to follow the behaviors that uh, are advocated in such messages. So in summary, why do we fall for fake news? We undervalue professional sources like expert journalistic sources. We ignore the problem of layered sources. We value other users over professional sources. And we you know, scrutinize information less when it comes to us in the context of a very personal space. That is one story, the story about sources. The second story today is about modality of fake news, the power of images, the power of video. Used to be that, you know, when we think about uh, seeing something, 
it is believing, right? This is something that is happening uh, increasingly in fake news as well. We are believing in fake news because we are seeing it with our own eyes. The modality of fake news has changed over the years. Previously, most of the rumors on social media were text-based, but increasingly, misinformation is coming to us in multiple modalities. And these rumors appear in richer modalities with picture, with audio, with video. And so these kinds of richer modalities can have deadly consequences. So in my native India, for example, uh, through this encrypted messaging platform of WhatsApp, which is owned by Facebook, uh, there are several cases of uh, false rumors through WhatsApp sent via video. Uh, so here's an example of um, how a video had a deadly consequence. Two men on a motorbike apparently snatch a young child off the street in a video that has spread a dangerous panic in India. In fact, this footage was filmed in this street in Karachi, Pakistan, not in India. And the full video makes clear this was not a real kidnapping, but an advert designed to promote child safety. The version spread on social media has this ending edited out. In India, at least eight people have been killed in a spate of lynchings. Mob anger, fueled by this and other fake news. So this was where you filmed the video? This Karachi advertising company made the video. They're horrified at how it's being used in India. I mean, this is, you know, very devastating for me. It's, it's very shocking for me. I, mean, I, I don't have words. I mean, some... I just want to, just I, to, I told you earlier, I want to see the face of that man who edited the video for bad purposes. The video was produced for this charity, working on abducted children. We made this video to help society, but it's being used wrongly and people are dying. We condemn this. Whoever is responsible should be prosecuted. The makers of this short film say it helped save children's lives in Pakistan. They're now coming to terms with its effects across the border in India. Sekanda Kamani, BBC News, Karachi. Two men. So we were motivated by this um, incident and series of incidents like this to ask the following question. Could use a video be the reason why WhatsApp rumors are having such deadly consequences? Does modality make a difference to the believability of online fake news? And if so, why? Modality has a history in our field uh, in terms of uh, psychological processing. Modality uh, you know, is something that has become a variable because increasingly news comes to us not just in terms of text, but with a lot of uh, richer uh, embellishments like uh, images and videos and so forth. So each individual modality, text, picture, audio, video, contains unique characteristics and is processed very distinctly. Um, and so this is the psychological the truism. But you know, beyond that, we need to think about how they affect us differently. We found in our studies that video is generally speaking more memorable than audio. Text and picture story is more memorable than text only story. But more memorability does not necessarily mean people are processing the story details any more deeply uh, or that they are critically evaluating that information. In fact, if anything, richer more, uh, modalities lead to more shallow processing. So what are the consequences of such shallow processing? It leads to what we call heuristic processing, it means we follow heuristics or rules of thumbs like uh, length equals strength, a long message is a strong message, or if it comes from a trusted source, if it comes from an expert source, a person in a white lab coat, then it's more believable. We don't pay attention to the content, but to kind of the peripheral aspects of the content. That's what we call heuristic processing. And it's contrasted very often with systematic processing, which is much more analytical, much more comprehensive, where we scrutinize the information. But we are all as human beings, cognitive misers. So our default is to resort to mental shortcuts or heuristics and to, in order to make expedient uh, decisions. So in this particular uh, context of WhatsApp and video, 
the modality of media presentation could be triggering certain heuristics that was kind of our hypothesis, which could then lead to how we perceive that content. And so we figured that um, the realism heuristic would be the one that would be most applicable, which is a rule of thumb that if it seems real, if I can see it, then it is believable. So we hypothesized that uh, pictures and video would lead to greater realism heuristic and therefore to higher evaluations of quality and credibility, even though the story is uh, fake. And so we conducted the study in India with different stories in different uh, content domains like health, crime, and politics. And we created three different versions of each of these stories, a text-only version, an audio version, and a video version. And as we hypothesized, we found that people found it much more credible. People believed in this fake news more if it was shown to them in video format than audio. And they believed in audio format more than in the text, even though the content was identical across the three conditions. And furthermore, we found that people were more likely to share the stories, intending to share the stories with family and friends if it came to them in video. And we, in our data analysis, noticed that the realism heuristic was the reason why this effect occurred. And we parsed this out by showing that people who did not know much about the issue, people who didn't know much about the topic of the news story, those with low issue involvement, were the ones who were more likely to fall for this realism heuristic. Whereas people who knew something about the topic were not likely to fall for the realism heuristic. So this tells us right away that if you're not effortfully thinking about this, uh, this topic or the story, if you don't have the necessary background, you're more willing to kind of fall for the heuristic or the superficial or shallow processing that is triggered by kind of a rich modality of presentation. And in our interviews with our participants, we saw this come up over and over again, where people would say things like, I could see it with my own eyes. That's why, you know, it, it cannot be false kind of thing. Even though if you look online uh, on for tips to spot fake news, this is from Facebook, you'll see that they very clearly talk about you know, how you should seriously consider the photos that it could be manipulated, images and videos could, uh, could be taken out of context. Um, you know, this is just one among many tips. Another one, of course, is about source, which we talked about earlier, uh, where, you know, the source of the story is very important for you to consider. And even with mainstream sources, the bias that the sources have, you know, there are sites like allsides.com where you can go to find out which of the media sources are clearly on the left or left leaning or which ones are center, which ones are right leaning or clearly on the right. And you should factor that in when you consider uh, a piece of information before you decide to accept that piece of information. And so this has become the new kind of wave of literacy where you know, we are being taught on how to spot fake news, where we need to consider the source, you know, we need to read beyond, we need to kind of see if other sources support it, or is it simply satire? Is it an onion story, for example? This has become even more important now, even more uh, vital in the context of uh, the pandemic, where we have all kinds of uh, fake news about uh, COVID vaccines and COVID before that. Um, and you know, we have uh, really far-fetched ideas about the, what the vaccine can and cannot do uh, to us. And so this has become uh, an important necessity of media literacy uh, and news literacy uh, as a kind of a, a necessary part of our consumption. And so we have to apply this news literacy to our reception of fake news, where we uh, not only become more literate about sources, but also more attentive to uh, digital manipulation. But the unfortunate reality is we live in, uh, in an age of information overload. We are just consuming news from all around us, from various different media, from our smartphones and social media feeds and so forth. So this kind of scrutiny, this kind of vigilance is not really tenable. It's not something that is humanly possible for us to keep doing all the time. And so what can be done about it? Our latest solution is to think of uh, using machine learning to automate this process in ways that um, can make it easy for platforms to tell us whether something is fake or something is real. And so in one of our projects conducted along with the College of Information Science and Technology, 
we are in the process of developing algorithms to detect fake news such that we can compare them with humans in their ability to um, you know, suss out these different aspects of source and modality and uh, numerous other things to figure out if a piece of information is fake or real as that information comes in. Um, and this is something that is supported by an NSF grant, uh, National Science Foundation grant, where you know, under the auspices of which we are systematically coming up with all the different features of uh, fake news in terms of its message and linguistic properties, the sources, the structural aspects like the URL type information, the network aspects, how it's circulated, and so forth. And you know, keep in mind, fake news is not just one thing. In fact, we already wrote an article about how fake news can be many different things. It's not just simply false information. It could be polarized commentary. It could be satire. It could be just plain misreporting. And so we need an elaborate algorithm that kind of goes through a decision tree that rules out these different aspects. And ultimately, we use all these features to kind of train a machine learning algorithm uh, to detect uh, fake news based on you know, fact-checked fake news versus um, you know, fact-checked real news. And so this is kind of the ongoing um, movement in uh, the communication and technology industries to find automated solutions to kind of flag fake news for us. And you know, when this um, grant came along a few years ago, there was a new story about um, our grant where the Penn State um, Press released a news uh, release about it, but pretty soon the news uh, media picked up on it and made it a fake news detector. And you can see there are lots of headlines that talk about fake news detector when in fact, all we said we would, we would be training using machine learning uh, to train machines. And so this detector became uh, the darling of the media where we had plenty of news uh, publications talking about detectors. Um, and ultimately, uh, this is, and the reason I'm showing you this is to show you how, uh, you know, funnily enough, there's fake news about our fake news project uh, because pretty soon st people started kind of building on this uh, information. Uh, another news outlet called it a device and we kept getting calls for how we can plug in this device. And so there are all kinds of, uh, uh, you know, embellishments, so to speak, on our story where people began to think that there's a, a chip that we would put inside a phone and so forth. And so several news outlets, um, you know, took liberty with our press release and started characterizing the, our, our um, uh, project in terms of, uh, you know, in terms that are well beyond the scope of the projects. Some even said that our, our algorithm will purge stories, that it would actually, uh, you know, uh, take out uh, fake stories. And we started getting phone calls from uh, reporters uh, worried that their stories would be purged, that they would be weeded out. And they were uh, very worried that our automated system may not recognize their true stories for what they are. And so we were inundated with uh, social media chatter about our um, study and uh, how it might be a regulation of free speech. And people wrote to the National Science Foundation, um, you know, talking about uh, how it's unfair uh, to uh, sponsor such research. So all we said in the PES news release is, wouldn't it be nice if our computers and mobile phones told us which news stories are real and which ones are fake, but then AP went along and added a detector to it. And then, uh, you know, reading out of fake news and purging fake news came into the picture. And then other news outlets started spreading that and the algorithms became uh, devices. Uh, we were only talking about detection, not purging. So this kind of unintentional misinformation is another you know, problem to solve, another hard problem to solve, in addition to all kinds of uh, deliberate um, misinformation uh, that I talked about uh, earlier. Uh, and so with that uh, story, let me stop and be happy to uh, take questions. I do thank you for your attention. Uh, I must thank our sponsors, National Science Foundation and WhatsApp for some of the research reported here and also for research assistant by my assistants, Menki Leo and uh, Yuan Sun. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, thank you so much for that presentation. We do have a lot of uh, questions coming in, a lot of questions that were pre-submitted. So let me uh, let me try to get to some of these uh, that have been pre-submitted first. So 
you talked a little bit about um, about identifying fake news, right? How can users immediately and easily identify fake news and sources and outlets, right? Many, many people aren't going to have that graphic that you had in your PowerPoint on their desktop every time they're reading. So are there some, are there some key things to look out for? Well, yeah, I mean, the, the, some of the key tips that you see repeated over and over again involve uh, paying attention to sourcing. Um, you know, that's something that I talked about. Who is it coming from? And then the motivations of sources as well. Uh, very important to consider. Uh, if it looks, uh, you know, too good to be true, if, you're, if, you're, if it confirms all your biases, it's right along the lines of what you're thinking, then that's another uh, kind of um, uh, thing to give you pause. You need to pause at that point and say, hey, this, this is too good to be true. Um, digital manipulation, if, you know, a lot of stories, uh, especially during crisis times, you know, during the Hurricane Harvey, people had all these pictures on their social media feed about, you know, uh, crocodiles kind of floating about in their backyard. These are images that you can immediately do a reverse Google search and make sure that this is not an image associated with uh, this particular story. Often these are old images that are kind of used out of context. Um, and so these are some dominant ones that uh, you, know, you should pay attention to. Uh, source is usually the best giveaway uh, and the best source. And ultimately, when we talk about sources, you want to triangulate and make sure that it's at least two sources are saying the same thing and two very different sources. Right. And in general, not social media sources. You know, one of the dangers of fake news um, is that it is distributed on social media, which makes it so easy for somebody to read a headline and immediately hit like or share that then distributes it to a broader, a broader network of folks. How can um, the, the rank and file citizens help to solve or reduce the problems of fake news? So sharing is, is a very big uh, reason why these fake stories become so viral. In fact, there are some studies that show that as much as 60% of um, URLs that are shared are shared without clicking. That is, people don't even click on the story to find out for themselves, but they share it because the headline seems to be interesting or sensational. And so we have a new wave of uh, uh, new kind of uh, movement, so to speak, which is... Uh, the movement of clickbait. You know, they are just looking for bait. Right. You know, clicks to. Uh, they are baiting you to click. And so these kinds of clickbaits are converting into what we call share bait in my lab group because what people are doing is not really clicking. They're just sharing. And so in in um, in se several platforms like WhatsApp, there's now a an effort to limit how many people you can share things with. You know, you cannot forward to more than a few contacts. And so when these WhatsApp murders happened in India, uh, that's one of the th first things that WhatsApp did is to limit the number of people to whom you can forward a particular piece of information. That way you can contain it. But people can also be more proactive uh, in you know, trying to uh, be gatekeepers, you know, trying to uh, make sure that they are you know, much more deliberate in their sharing rather than just sharing things for fun or things that uh, are very well aligned with their points of view. And so they need to exercise uh, caution. Often in our interviews with participants, um, they, they often said that they share because they think it'll be helpful to others. Um, and so that's one kind of sharing. There are others who share because their political viewpoint is being magnified by that story. And so they use that as a way to kind of, um, you know, uh, uh, proliferate that particular point of view. So there are different intentions for sharing. So thinking about uh, intentionality is also very important. So um, you said something that has sparked a question in the chat box here. You, you, meant, you said reverse Google search. Can you talk about what you mean by reverse Google search? Well, you can Google reverse Google search, but basically what you do is you put an image, you can actually uh, whatever image you're seeing, you can feed that into a search engine, just like you would put a search term in Google, and you'll get to, you'll get to see what the pedigree of that particular picture or image, and you'll get to see. Uh, and in fact, uh, one of the people on the chat have in fact posted how you can do a Google image search. Okay. So yeah. Excellent. Um, 
can you talk a little bit about, um, so it seems like when, whenever somebody uh, might identify fake news, it doesn't take too long for somebody to then post a link from Snopes.com, um, either affirming or, or debunking uh, whatever that fake news might be. How legitimate is, is Snopes? Is that a good source for um, trying to debunk uh, fake news? Yeah, I mean, uh, Snopes and PolitiFact have established themselves um, as good fact-checking organizations uh, over time. Again, I'm not here to endorse any one particular product over right. another, but uh, uh, Snopes is one of the ones that uh, have a reputation. That doesn't mean that uh, they're always correct. Uh, they, they do make mistakes. Um, there are several such fact-checking organizations. Again, I would recommend uh, double-checking, you know, not just uh, looking at one source. And uh, studies have come out now that show that fact-checking works. Like if, if you know a social media contact who's spreading fake news, and if you, uh, sh you know, uh, in your response, uh, put a fact-checked uh, version of it, they usually... Um, are stand corrected. Uh, there are of course uh, people who will troll you and things, but in the, in, a, in, a, in general, we find that people change their mind if given uh, convincing evidence from a fact-checking organization. Yeah, so we've all seen this happen, right? We've seen a family member or a friend of ours post something on Facebook, right? Or share something on Facebook. And then a hundred comments later, the conversation has just deteriorated into, into personal attacks, right? And people trying to convince them that what they've shared is what they've shared is wrong. So a couple of questions around that. First, what is the psych? You said you studied the psychology around this. What is the psychology around the person who has initially posted something and their kind of absolute uh, belief that it's correct, regardless of you know how the conversation has has rolled out, right? That conversation never ends with the person who posted the original piece saying, yeah, you know what, I was wrong, right? Um, so what's, what's the psychology uh, of the person who wants to double down on what they've shared? So the, the first part of that uh, sharing activity is the psychology of scooping. Like if you're a journalist, you kind of know that tendency where you want to be the first to get the story out. And so we are all at some level wanting to be the first person to get the story out to our network. So we kind of try to uh, scoop the story, so to speak, which inevitably means that we don't uh, do a thorough fact verification and double checking and so forth. And furthermore, if it is something that is well aligned with your point of view and you think uh, you, you have a kind of vested interest in it, then you kind of dig your heels in and you become identified with it. So that's kind of what I said earlier about in my presentation about, um, you know, if it comes in your personal space, your identity is so wrapped up around it that, it, you know, any attack on that information is an attack on your identity. And so it's very important yeah. for people who are kind of questioning this to make sure that they deal with it in a way that does not um, attack the identity of the person who's uh, promoting this false information. And there are all kinds of uh, now uh, tips for uh, you know, dealing with the situation. Um, uh, if you like, I can show you a couple of tips here um, on my screen. If I were, if I can share a screen real quick. So this is uh, yeah, published. Uh, this is published um, information. But you know, how to kind of talk to your uh, relatives about this? This is a very important uh, aspect, right? So you know, first of all, assess how willing they are to listen. You know, if they are people who are highly motivated in that point of view, and they've systematically processed that information, not heuristically processed that information, then they probably will not be very willing to listen to, you know, counter opinions. And then you have to be careful about whether it's a, it's an important enough battle to, uh, you know, fight. Uh, you can go private. You can do a DM, a direct message, instead of doing it in public and embarrassing them. You should not attack them. Uh, you should you know, ask questions um, and you should frame this as both of you being on a common journey to find the truth rather than uh, you kind of uh, getting into a battle with that person. You should not overwhelm them with scientific jargon. You, sh you should try to find common ground, um, you know, with each other. What, some, what are some basic established facts 
between you two? What are some sources that both of you trust? Um, you have to acknowledge the emotion involved. Um, you have to establish your credentials that you know what you're talking about. And you also have to tailor the message uh, such that, you know, um, their conspiracy theories uh, may not be the same as the ones that you might have seen others espouse. Uh, you should also have a discussion about the sources with them. Uh, you should refer to agreement among known experts that they might respect. Um, and, you know, talk about uh, what is true and, you know, not just rejecting them. Uh, and then, you know, telling some people don't even know how the whole social media network works. So even educating them about um, that, that as well is very helpful. So these kinds of tips are available for talking to relatives about your, um, uh, about these kinds of uh, fake news spread that happens, especially on encrypted platforms like WhatsApp, where it's very difficult for corrective action to be taken by others. Uh, so it has to be between you and the person um, uh, sharing. So yeah, and there's, there's a, I can provide a link for it. Um, it's uh, science behavior. If you were to look up this online, uh, the, this is basically um, um, S-C-I-B-E-H. Uh, and you'll, you'll find it. And you can just say dealing with misinformation and you'll find it. If not, we'd be happy to follow up with that. So um, Quadro in the chat box is asking uh, for kind of an operational definition of news. Um, and there's a couple other questions that maybe are related to that around, um, sometimes we hear differing opinions, one side calling a, another side's opinion or another side's position fake news, um, which, which may not necessarily be true. So is it safe to say that a good definition for fake news is news that is intentionally put out there to mislead an audience? Yeah, I mean, the, the if, if you're talking, there are many different kinds of fake news, like we talked about. Fake news is not just false information. There's also propaganda. There's, um, you know, uh, what we call native advertising, where advertisements kind of um, uh, are masked to look like news stories. So it's this, the deceptive intent is one thing. There are certain, certain types of uh, fake information is necessarily meant to deceive. A lot of it is meant to just get clicks. Uh, the kids in Macedonia, the teenagers in Macedonia who sat and manufactured fake news about Hillary Clinton and also fake news about Donald Trump during the 2016 election, were doing that simply to seed them in all these social media platforms so that they could get more clicks and make money out of it. So they were not necessarily looking to deceive anyone for political purposes, but purely financial incentive for them. So looking at intentionality will not give us um, the true answer, but rather it'll help us understand where they're coming from, where the source is coming from and what might be some underlying motivations. Uh, but for false news itself, we need to consider uh, whether it, it uh, aligns with facts whether it is a true event that occurred, uh, did Pope uh, did the Pope indeed endorse Trump or not endorse Trump? Um, you know things like that, and so we would verify that with multiple uh, sources, uh, and that's usually the way to kind of try and uh, verify rather than go deeper into uh, intentionality, which is often very difficult to find anyway. Would you, what would you say, so you show the great video of uh, an event that happened that was actually filmed in Pakistan, uh, but actually um, had implications in another country, right? Mm -hmm. are, are, there, um, are there legal implications to what the, um, what the person who edited the, the video and disseminated that in India, are there legal implications that that eventually led to the lynchings that you have uh, put out, that you have thought about happening uh, as a as a cause that they caused, right? Related to that that fake video, uh, the people who produced that video are the, Is it a criminal activity when that happens? Well, the people who produced the video were the ones who were interviewed on, in that BBC news story that you saw. That's the ad agency that right. put out that video for the purpose of um, cautioning people about um, um, you know, how indeed uh, it's so easy 
for um, someone to um, um, you know, kidnap a, a child. It just takes a few seconds. But what uh, others did is they misappropriate the video. They took out that cautionary uh, kind of um, uh, this one at the end, message at the end, and then made it look like there are people in your neighborhood, there are these shady strangers who are coming to right. kidnap your children. And so anybody and everybody who was a stranger in, the, in that town or looked like, you know, somewhat like that person in that grainy video was uh, then kind of rounded up and lynched. Um, and so the person who kind of first edited that uh, out and kind of right. pushed that through, so th those are the people who would be legally liable and in fact, uh, you know, they even before getting into that kind of legality, uh, they are violating the terms and conditions of the platform. Like YouTube, for example, uh, has uh, a certain set of uh, terms and conditions. Even, you know, they keep issuing new ones. They, they even came out with one for COVID now. They will not, uh, inc you know, they will not allow any videos uh, that talk about how the vaccine is a hoax and so forth. Um, so the platforms themselves, uh, the platform terms and conditions themselves are violated. So that's the first line of offense when they do these kinds of things. And then furthermore, when these have these kinds of, you know, deadly consequences, they're even more, you know, criminally uh, liable. Uh, and, it, but the challenge is to catch who does this and, you know, uh, what their intentions are. And so, yeah, uh, it's certainly a legal issue. I'm not a lawyer, but uh, certainly has those sure. kinds of ramifications. Yeah. Yeah. Do you see um, Do you see laws being passed uh, specifically targeting fake news, uh, either here in the states or abroad? I mean, historically, we've had uh, laws that talk about uh, information uh, that could be, um, you know, uh, defamatory or seditious and things like that. So, I can certainly see how uh, false information of um, certain kinds. Uh, especially with certain motivations, if you establish them, could have uh, the kinds of legal consequences. But it also, you know, uh, is a very tricky situation because satire, for example, uh, will not be something that you should penalize uh, as long as it's fully right. disclosed that it's satire. Uh, so the problem is the person who takes the story from Onion but takes out the masthead and sends it across as if it right. came from a real source. And so that's the subtle uh, change that is actually uh, problematic from a legal point of view. And I think laws need to kind of catch up on these kinds of misappropriation, um, which I, th I think is definitely on the cards, uh, but it, it's a very uh, slippery slope because of First Amendment issues. I thought one of the more interesting and relevant slides that you put up there was the one about who is the source, right? Yeah. Is it the person that shared it on Twitter? Is it the politician? Is it the original news source? And then off to the side you put, or is it Twitter, right? Is, is the platform the source? And I know that that has become a topic of, of recent conversation. What do, you, um, what do you think the responsibility of the platforms where these information is being disseminated is um, in terms of policing the information that's on their platform? Yeah, this is really the hot button issue right now uh, in the tech industry, especially with uh, Twitter banning uh, uh, Trump for good. Um, and before that, you had uh, for about two years this debate going on. Uh, soon after the 2016 election uh, fake news uh, fiasco, Mark Zuckerberg of uh, Facebook uh, kind of uh, poo pooed the idea that uh, you know Facebook would be a serious platform for news, and that you know people knew better. And so we should not be in the position of being a publisher. We are not a publisher. We are more like a newsstand. You know, the, the analogy is more of a you know, vendor who sells the newspaper rather than a publisher who publishes or is responsible for published information. That was kind of the stance for a long time of these platforms. But increasingly, that is changing as, you, as you've seen now. And uh, if indeed um, uh, platforms uh, you know, start... Uh, using these kinds of um, terms and condition violation as grounds for removing people. That means they are indeed looking at content. They are gatekeeping content. The moment you get into gatekeeping content, you become a publisher. Uh, and the moment you are seen as a publisher, then you become you know, legally uh, liable. Um, and so in some ways, this is um, 
a, a trap, so to speak, for social media platforms, because on the one hand, they said that uh, you know, anybody and everybody uh, should be able to have their say. But on the other hand, uh, some of what uh, is being said and broadcast and so forth are having these deadly consequences. Some people are you know, broadcasting very wild stuff live through these platforms, and there needs to be you know, some kind of uh, oversight or some kind of uh, detection. Uh, and so uh, at this point, policy is not yet caught up with this reality. It's still being debated, and there's going to be all kinds of debates uh, in the next few months and years um, about this issue. Uh, and so, you know, we don't have a, a very clear, clean answer to this question. It is definitely a messy situation. Um, Whitney's asking, is there a role for MBTI, MBTI or EQI in um, identifying for fake news? Well, we are working toward solutions, automated solutions for identifying fake news. There is, um, you know, certainly um, a, a kind of uh, a list of rules of do's and don'ts that you can follow to kind of uh, try and uh, identify fake news. Uh, but still, it requires enormous vigilance if done by humans. And so uh, right now, uh, automated solutions seem to be the way to go. Fact-checking organizations are heavily relied upon by Facebook and others to kind of have uh, armies of people fact-checking and then moderating these stories. And so uh, if you know, automation is used at a low level to escalate certain stories to human uh, uh, scrutiny, and then uh, the human moderators take kind of the ultimate uh, decision. So content moderation is, is the key going forth. Um, and it's a combination of machines and humans. I don't, I don't think we have, we'll have any uh, kind of uh, metric that is universally accepted. It's going to be platform uh, specific for the most part. Have you found in your work that there's maybe a particular group or demographic more susceptible to fake news than others? Uh, we actually studied this in the context of that WhatsApp video. We found that a lot of these WhatsApp killings happen in rural areas in India. So when we recruited participants, half our participants came from urban areas and the other half from rural areas. And we systematically uh, looked at the data to see if uh, rural uh, participants were more susceptible um, to the effects of video. Um, and we found indeed that uh, rural participants were less likely to be aware of digital manipulation than urban. But um, interestingly, we found that sharing was much more common among people who are highly educated, um, you know, people who are wealthy and not necessarily uh, people who are rural. And so when it comes to making things go viral, um, pretty much everybody is in, involved and culpable. It's not just uh, people who are less educated or people who are in the lower socioeconomic uh, strata of society. Um, and so we, we are not finding uh, big individual differences, although we see that some of these deadly effects, the mob mentality, et cetera, seem to happen in certain uh, parts that are associated, let's say, with lower education or lower, lower socioeconomic status. Well, there are so many questions that we don't have that we don't have time to get to. This is a definitely a hot topic uh, now, as as we hear about it, referenced almost every day uh, from uh, in in one corner of social media or the other. Uh, but we want to thank you for joining us here on the virtual speaker series today. Thank you so much for your presentation and for joining us. Thank you for having me. And I want to thank everybody who joined us on Facebook Live and right here in our Zoom room. Uh, as a reminder, we'll be hosting additional speaker sessions in the coming weeks and months. And this programming is in addition to a wide array of online career networking events offered through the Penn State Alumni Association. You can see all of our virtual events at alumni.psu.edu slash events. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, and thank you for all you do for the university, for the glory, and for the future. We are.